Now we're going to talk about women from the Northern Renaissance. The women we have information about are primarily from the lowlands. In other words, what would today be uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, Belgium, of course, was Flanders, and many of these artists come from uh, Bruges or Ghent. Documentary evidence indicates that there are more women artists in Northern Europe in the 15th and 16th century than perhaps there were in Italy. Now, most of these documents concern artists from Flanders, uh, from the lowlands, the Netherlandish countries, uh, what would today be Belgium, although they may move to other countries. Um, some of the women uh, we'll hear about were the daughters of artists, and that would be the most frequently. We also know that many of these women seem to have worked as illuminators, and some of the evidence there is that in 1480, in the Bruges St. John the Evangelist Guild, uh, the records indicate that approximately 25 percent of the names listed are female names. Now, the St. John's Guild is not the Painters Guild. Uh, the Painters and Apothecaries and Physicians Guild was the St. Luke's Guild. And I've looked at the published records of the Bruges St. Luke's Guild, and in this time period there are no women artists listed. But the St. John the Evangelist Guild was the guild of people who were involved in the bookmaking trade. And these would be scribes, illuminators, and bookbinders. We don't know how many of this 25% female uh, were illuminators, were painting the pictures in the manuscripts. But uh, some of them may have been scribes. We don't know how many of that 25% of the female artists in the St. John the Evangelist Guild were uh, illuminators or the person who painted the pictures in manuscripts. Uh, some of them may have been scribes and it's even possible that some could have both been both scribes and illuminators, uh, writing both text and doing pictures. One of the 15th century women artists that are recorded is Margaret von Eyck, the sister of Jan and Hubert von Eyck. Uh, and those of you who have taken survey course or uh, know something about 15th century Netherlandish art would know that Jan van Eyck is one of the most famous painters of the 15th century. Now, we don't know any works of art by Margaret von Eyck. Once again, we're talking about a record, someone writing about it. And this isn't actually a documentary record. Uh, what it is is uh, literature. Lucas de Hare, who was a 16th century Ghent painter and poet, wrote an ode about the Ghent altarpiece. And in it, he says that Hubert von Eyck began the work, but death alters all plans. In other words, Hubert died, we know from documents, he died in 1426. And then, Lucas de Hare says in his poem, he, Hubert, is buried here next to his sister, who amazed many people with her paintings. So that's the first mentioned that we have that there was a sister of uh, Jan and Hubert von Eyck, who was a painter. The other record that we have about Margaret von Eyck is a bit later. It's Karl von Manders' Het Schilderbuch from 1601. Uh, Het Schilderbuch, it translates as the Book of Painters. Uh, Karl von Mander was a uh, Harlem painter and he wrote this book uh, in imitation, in a sense, of Vasari. He's often known as the Vasari of the North uh, because he's writing a book about painters uh, from Northern Europe. He's writing at a fairly late date uh, to know anything about the 15th century artists, but he does mention Marguerite von Eyck, which we would translate as Margaret, uh, on the chapter of, ja of Jan and Hubert von Eyck. And he says, their sister, Marguerite von Eyck became famous for her painting too. Like Minerva, Marguerite shunned Hyman and Lucina and remained in maiden state to the end of her life. Hyman, of course, is the uh, god of, mar of marriages in uh, classical mythology. And so he's saying that she remained a virgin to the end of her life. Some people have suggested that that meant that she was a nun and uh, that she painted miniatures uh, in manuscripts in a convent. Uh, 
Uh, but the fact that she's buried not in a convent cemetery, uh, but next to uh, Hubert von Eich, uh, as, as uh, Lucas de Hare says, uh, says that that's not necessarily so, um, but that she may have remained unma unmarried. So we don't know what she worked on. We don't know what her work was like. Uh, we don't know if she was a panel painter or a miniaturist, uh, or both. Um, all we have are those two references. Now, here's another artist whom we don't have any works by. Uh, your textbook talks about her, Elizabeth Schweppens. And Elizabeth Schweppens is uh, recorded in 1476 as a pupil of Willem Vreeland. Now, Willem Vreeland uh, is uh, a manuscript illuminator in Bruges. Uh, the two most famous manuscript illuminators uh, from the 15th century at Bruges would be Vreeland and uh, Simon Beinig, who is a little younger, lives a little longer. Um, I have just here, I have a picture of a manuscript that's attributed to Vreeland, just to give you the idea of uh, what some of his miniatures might, might look like. I can't show you a work by Schweppens because we don't know. Uh, it's possible that some of the things that are attributed to Vreeland or his followers may be by her, but we have no way of knowing unless uh, we would find a manuscript that actually would have some kind of inscription stating uh, who the illuminator was. And, and that's very, very rare. One of the interesting things about uh, Schweppens is when Vreeland died in 1481, his widow inherited the workshop. And Schweppens helped her run the shop. Now, that's very interesting, and I think that may be one reason why we do see, um, at least in, in uh, some records, more indications that there may have been some women who were, for example, manuscript illuminators. Because the laws of inheritance would be that um, if a painter or any other person dies, that the, fam the widow would have rights uh, to the inheritance. And if he died without a male heir, he didn't have a, a son to take, carry on the business, then the widow would be able to carry on the business if she had the knowledge or could hire the right people. So for example, um, not necessarily with painters, but certainly we do know of uh, instances where the widow marries a journeyman uh, who then has, what, uh, a secure career and carries on a workshop of some kind. Um, another possibility, of course, if the widow had been helping the uh, painter and had enough training, perhaps she could do it by herself, but very frequently she might not because she's doing all the housework. So she may uh, inherit the workshop and run the business end and have journeymen uh, continue to run the shop. In this case, they had a woman who was trained by Vreeland herself who becomes, um, I gather, a partner uh, or at least an employee. And uh, since it's a woman, uh, there's no need to have to marry her and there's no need um, what can I say, to, to be pushed aside for, the, for uh, a man. The, the, the two women presumably continue to run the shop. Um, records state that Schweppens was a guild member between 1476 and 89, which, when presumably she would have died at that time. One other uh, artist who seems to have been trained as a manuscript illuminator uh, is Susanna Horenbout. Now, the Horenbout family is quite a prominent uh, family in the art world, particularly for uh, miniatures and illuminations. Uh, well, who were they? Uh, the father was named Herart, or Gerard. Uh, the, the son was Lucas, and his daughter, Susanna, evidently, uh, also was a painter. Uh, they were from Ghent. And Herart uh, was a painter to Margaret of Austria, the regent of the Netherlands, uh, where he painted panel paintings and manuscript illuminations, both. And we have uh, works by him. In the 1520s, uh, the family moved to England. And Lucas Horenbount becomes a miniaturist to the Tudor court. 
According to von Maunder, he says that it's Lucas Hornbad who taught Holbein to uh, paint miniatures. Now, we don't have any certain works by Susanna. Um, I have seen a book that has some manuscript illuminations in it that they uh, attribute to her. Uh, but we're not certain exactly what she painted. She probably was an assistant to her father. She was probably trained by her father. And the reason we know that she was a painter is because she's mentioned as an illuminator by Dewar. Uh, Albrecht Dewar, uh, writing in his journal in 1421, says that Master Herard, the illuminator, has a daughter about 18 years old called Susanna. She made an illumination of the Savior, for which I paid one gilder. It is a great marvel that a woman can do so well. Now, you might think about that last phrase. It's a great marvel, and I've actually seen this translated. It's a great miracle uh, that a woman can do so well. Um, the assumption, of course, that women were weak and uh, incapable. So he's paying her a compliment, but at the same time, it's somewhat of a slam to women, uh, but that would be pretty normal for the time. One of the other women artists, and this, one, this person we actually do have uh, works of art that are attributed to her, is Lavinia Baining Turlick. Baining is her maiden name, Turlick is her married name, and you do see a variety of spellings of both Baining and Turlick. Uh, she lived probably from about 1515 to 1578. And I'm sorry, I don't have a very good reproduction. This was the only one I could find, and it's not particularly clear in places. Uh, but this is believed to be a self-portrait uh, in a little miniature. Uh, we know that Lavinia Turlick was the daughter to the very famous Bruges illuminator, Simon Bainig. And she's undoubtedly trained by her father, and she becomes a miniaturist painter to the Tudor court of England. And uh, the little picture that I have here is a miniature of the Princess Elizabeth before she became queen. Here it is in 1551 uh, when she's 18 years old. And uh, she works for the tutors from Henry VII uh, to Elizabeth I. One of the things that you often will read in books is that she had a higher salary than Hans Holbein. Uh, so she was evidently uh, thought of quite uh, well by the tutors. Uh, miniatures were extremely popular, and uh, so we do see, here's another uh, view of slightly different uh, color. I haven't seen the original. Uh, this is the same miniature, just slightly different color. Uh, miniaturists were very, very popular in the Tudor court, and uh, they were not considered to be sort of minor artists uh, just because they painted something small. In fact, uh, small and delicate uh, was often considered to be um, a very, very skilled. Uh, a few other things that are attributed to Turlick. Uh, the first great seal of Elizabeth I, and also the seal of Mary. And so the design is attributed to Turlick. Uh, presumably someone, a metalsmith, probably cast it. But there you see uh, the impression of the seal uh, with the young queen uh, on her throne very centralized composition, uh, holding the orb of, well, she doesn't really rule the entire globe, but it's traditional for, art, for uh, monarchs to hold a globe, uh, going back so clear, clear to the Roman emperors, and uh, of course the scepter, uh, all the accoutrements of uh, showing her uh, queenly state, her royal state. Uh, this little miniature, which as you can see is, uh, has got a whole crowd scene in there, it's called Monday Sunday, uh, was her New Year's gift to Queen Elizabeth I. And we do have records of gifts that she gave to the monarchs. Uh, this little miniature, which you can see has a whole crowd of people in it, uh, shows Monday Sunday, uh, and it is recorded as the New Year's gift to Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, and we, there are records uh, in the royal archives that show uh, Lavinia Turlick giving gifts of, of her paintings uh, to the various monarchs.